let's uh, start with um, addressing this more toward uh, Griffin and Roper. The, the recent uh, NDAAs, particularly in 16, 17, and 2018, have sought to address the problem of the slow, ineffective acquisition programs. Now, this is something we've been concerned about. This committee has uh, explored. We Every time we pass another NDAA, we set up a system to try to correct uh, the failures that we've had in the past in, in acquisition. Uh, some of the prominent acquisition failures that we've talked about, we have to keep in mind that they, they were real. And I'm particularly concerned about it because three of these directly affected uh, the the Army in my state of Oklahoma. We had the future combat system. We all remember that. That was going to resolve all of our problems. Uh, we got it into $20 billion into that and then junked the system. The Comanche helicopter, similar thing happened. That was $7.9 billion. The Crusader, I remember that well. That was uh, $2.2 billion. Now, this is money that was spent for which we got nothing out of. It was, it was a total waste, as I see it. The expeditionary fighting uh, vehicle, uh, 3.2 billion, the Expeditionary Combat Support System, 1 billion, that's Air Force uh, computer system. And all of those that we just mentioned uh, add up to $67 billion, or roughly equal to the amount of money authorized in the fiscal year NDAA for o OCO. Now, we're looking at this right now. Uh, most of the people on this panel believe that we need to do something a CR it punishes our military. It's just a, a continuation of the failures that we've had in the, in the past. So my feeling has been that uh, we need to make some adjustments. So when this, the, all these decisions are going to be made, I guess some of them uh, today and tomorrow, we've got to keep in mind the problems that we have in, uh, in, in our military. So let me just say, Dr. Griffin and Dr. Roper, with the recent changes in the acquisition process and new organization set to uh, take effect on February the 1st, how are the two of you going to learn from past mistakes and ensure that we do not repeat them while providing our service members with the best military uh, available? And again, it's not just the last three fiscal years that we're talking about. Uh, many years ago, I was on the House Armed Services Committee. We were trying to get acquisition reform at that time. So uh, I'd like to get your response to that, your ideas now. Um, if you'd like me to proceed first, sir. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. um, thank you, Senator Inhofe. Uh I'm not the first, I'm not even the first here in this uh, hearing today to comment on the unseemly role of process procedure, excessive bureaucracy in decision-making on acquisitions of new systems in the Pentagon or by the Pentagon. Um, so I, I agree with your remarks. I, I think the remedy starts with um, renewing our national commitment to developing systems through experiments, prototypes, operational prototypes, before we commit to major weapon system acquisitions. Um, I, in, his, in his opening remarks, uh, Dr. Roper mentioned the SR-71, mm -hmm. uh, the, the most magnificent airplane ever built to date. It, it was fielded some 50 years ago. Few people remember that the SR-71, before it went into production, was preceded by the YF-12A which was a prototype airplane designed to ring out the problems of Mach 3 flight mm -hmm. before we had to commit to an actual acquisition. Few people remember that the F-117 stealth fighter, uh, the capability that we deployed during the first Gulf War, was preceded by prototype development of the first six operational prototype airplanes, mm -hmm. and that that was done in 32 months. Yeah. So, so uh, restoring that style of program development uh, I think is the key. Okay, uh, Dr. Roper, why don't you follow up on that just briefly? Uh, yes, Senator, I completely agree with Dr. Griffin's points. I'll just add a couple of my own. I think the, the rigidity and the complexity of the requirements process stacks the deck against us up front. I know many of you have seen the hundreds of pages of requirements that, that are often uh, part of programs that are very complex. Um, when a, when a system is specified that rigidly up front, there's not a lot of trade space for program managers to explore, to prototype concepts. 
and avoid getting requirements that, that really the technology base is not able to achieve. But and when that happens, you, you have to have those technologies mature for the program to proceed. And so you get too many miracles that have to occur. So being able to pull the risk early would, and be able to prototype an experiment to retire them would, would be a, a huge benefit. I also believe that designing for sustainability and upgradability is not something that the department as a whole does well. Um, we design for performance, but not for things to evolve into the future. And uh, to help us in that, in that matter, we should look at commercial technology and practices uh, to, to, guide our, to guide our thoughts. And we're not extremely good at, at incorporating commercial technology because our rigid requirements process often says it's not good enough in one facet or okay. another. Yeah, well, those are good points, and uh, my time has expired, but I do want to uh, sit down with the two of you uh, sometime in the next few days to talk about some specifics, because that's a problem. Sooner or later, we're going to have to resolve.